ask, did you all know that God has a plan for aging? For what? Aging. aging. Yeah. Well, he does. <laughs> Here, I'll, I got it. I'll share it with you. <laughs> Quote, most seniors never get enough exercise. In his wisdom, God decreed that seniors become forgetful so they would have to reach for their glasses, their keys, and other things, thus doing more walking. And God looked down and saw that it was good. <laughs> then God saw that there was another need. In his wisdom, he made seniors lose coordination so that they would drop things re requiring them to bend and reach and stretch. And God looked down from heaven and saw that this was good. See, I'm sure his plan here. Then God, God considered the function of the bladder and decided seniors would have additional uh, calls of nature requiring more trips to the bathroom thus providing more exercise, and God looked down and saw that it was good. So, if you uh, find as you age that you are getting up and down more, remember it's God's will. It is all in your best interest, even though you mutter, we know you do, under your breath. Here's some other little tidbits. There's others, but I'm only going to read a few. God's health is merely the slowest possible rate at which one can die. <laughs> Ever think about that for good health? See? You just. All right. Here's another one. Give a person a fish, and you will feed him for a day. Teach that person to use the internet, and they won't bother you for weeks, months, maybe years. <laughs> All of us would, <clears throat> could take a lesson from the weather. It pays no attention, uh, attention to criticism. <laughs> weather pays no attention to criticism. Yeah. In the 60s, people took acid to make the world weird. Now the world is weird, and people take Prozac to make it normal. <laughs> Not promoting pro taking Prozac. Okay, let's uh, have prayer, and we will begin our message of uh, putting on the whole armor of God, part 10. Lord Jesus, we do pray for the, these messages that we're having. We just pray that people will come to a deeper understanding of what true biblical righteousness is, and 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 come within the Word of God on what righteousness is, what it means for us, putting on, the, on that part of the armor. It is essential for us that we have your righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, not our own righteousness, not our own uh, carnal uh, musings and philosophies that we like to take pride in, and ego is all a part of that, and how smart we are, and how clever we are. It has nothing to do with any of that. It's getting into your word, staying in your word, believing your word, proclaiming your word, and walking in that word, and you are that word of Christ that we are to walk in. Amen and amen. Okay, um, again, this is part 10, putting on the whole armor of God. And we're still in, in this section on uh, righteousness, understanding righteousness. And I will read the main verse on that that we're in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. I'm skipping down because there's a lot to cover. Verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And I have to ask, are 
people walk in the truth? Do they, do they desire truth? And, of course, you look at the uh, high regard that people have of the media today, the high regard they have for uh, Hollywood, the high regard they have for uh, all manner of liars and deceivers, including in the church world. They go to these churches that, to a large extent, with major portions of their doctrine, are absolutely lying to the people. And we've kind of skirted around it here and, and uh, talked about it, not meaning uh, just in this ministry, but other type ministries uh, that believe as we do, and, but putting their seal of approval on it. I think we need to stop that, folks. We need to expose the deception of Judeo-Christianity and what they have been doing and, and that they are a major part of what is wrong in our nation today, wrong with our people, because they're not being fed the truth. Why do we, I mean, nobody has total truth, obviously. We can, every, we can point our fingers, but I mean, there are blatant falsities that are being promoted in the Judeo-Christian world, and we know many of them. I'm not going to get off the point here and get into them, but truth is vital. But also, in, in light of what we're talking about here with regard to the subject matter of righteousness and having on the breastplate of righteousness as being that is supposed to be part of our shield, part of our armor. And again, remember the story we first started in this series with uh, David and Saul. And, and David had to put off Saul's armor. Uh, but we need to put on the armor of Christ. Walk in, in, um, in Christ. Now, we want to go back to where we left off last week in uh, Romans chapter 9. I want to uh, have you turn there to Romans chapter 9, verse 21. Uh, what... Um, I'm sorry, it'll be um, Romans uh, chapter 10. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10. Sorry for that. See, you got to pay attention. I've already misled you here. Uh, and I try, you know, quite seriously, if a minister's worth his salt, he's going to do everything in his power not to mislead the people. And... Uh, you, you get into the true function of the church and what the true church is all about. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's profound. And uh, we've got to get into that. One day soon, we're going to get more into the church and the church function and, the, and uh, true what that true biblical church is all about. But uh, here in um, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. First of all, there's other things we can pay attention to in this verse, certainly. But what I pointed out to people, look at the context of this verse. This is whom these verses in this chapter are addressed to. Do you all understand that? It shouldn't be hard. But I, we all know that uh, there are deceivers out there who um, have really messed the minds of people up. And again, I'm going to point at Judeo-Christianity, especially in the Judeo-Christian church and the Judeo-Christian teaching. But this is vitally important that we get this down. It's not just making a point to be making a point. It's vital to the context of these verses that we understand. Because these verses are going to get into, quote, salvation. So whom are these verses or words of, quote, salvation unto? Now, certainly... As we point out last time, these verses are speaking this uh, 
Bible truth of righteousness, giving us a little more understanding of righteousness in these verses also. So God's prayer uh, and his prayer, Paul's prayer, to God for Israel. Verse 2, for I bear them record. Whom record? Israel, Israelites. Now, all through the Bible, again, we have to stress and point out that the message from Genesis to Revelation is God's word to Israel. I'm not making that up. It's not something I pulled out of my head. I'm not saying it to be anything in the uh, secular way of thinking in this. It's this, this is getting into Bible understanding. We want to be Bible fed. That's where we get God's word from. It's God's word to us in the Bible. And that truth will set us free. It's Christ. And we, as we absorb God's word and his truth, it becomes Christ in you. And it's the hope of glory. All right. For I bear Israel. Let's insert that word because that's what it means. For I bear is, uh, Israel record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to the knowledge or, or to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Here we have that word, righteousness. And going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Which uh, someone has pointed out, that's Jesus. And that's whom God Almighty is. God came, became flesh and dwelt among us. And God, we want God in us. We want Christ Jesus in us, ruling and reigning in us. And, and the way we do that, again, to a large degree, is through the Word. Now, it's through the Word that we obtain faith. You don't just come, people don't just come along, our Israelites don't just come along and receive Christ by faith without the word. I um, have written a book this, uh, that details much of this, but I have not put the book out. And uh, I'm not going to get into why I have not. I'm going to one of these days, I pray. Get into that, but it's a controversial. And uh, I'm not going to be uh, talk more on that. But when we, when we want to understand faith, and we want to understand how it comes to us, you're also talking about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. And, quote, Terms like being spirit-filled. What does that really mean? I submit to you, in a, in a large degree, we have been lied to on that very subject too. And a lot of us are living the, quote, spirit-filled life in a false way. But we do want the Spirit-filled life, do we not? We want Christ in us. We want the Holy Spirit. We want to be led by His anointing. Now, the way He gives us anointing is His Holy Spirit working in us through the reading of His Word, and we get inspiration from that Word to give us vision, understanding, giving us truth, and what real righteousness means and how we can apply it and live it in our lives. It's vitally important, and that's what changes society. That's what brings about wonderful change within us, within our family, within our nation. The more we get into what real righteousness is, and this whole process that we're talking about here, we're going to see greater change in our nation. 
And this gets into who is ruling over us today. Folks, most of these um, snakes and wolves that are ruling over us today, they need to be gone. They need to be removed. That's just put it as nicely as I possibly can. Believe me, I could say a lot more on that, cleaning out the swamp. But they need to be removed. They're not here to lead us in righteousness. They're not, they're, they don't have Bible answers. They never turn to the Word of God for answers on what we should be doing. By the way, that's why they did not want a lot of people in government. They did not want Judge Roy Moore in office. I'm not lifting up Judge Roy uh, Moore as a standard of, of uh, and making him an angelic being, a saint of God, or anything like that. He has his problems. He's flesh and blood just like we are. He has shortcomings and failures just like we all do. But I tell you what, he's growing in the Word. Long time ago, he remember he put forth the Ten Commandments and they fought him and fought him over that. He did. He's he has made it known that he is standing for God's biblical purposes and stated so many a time as a judge. And now he's doing the very same thing, especially on homosexuality. That disturbs them as to why one of the main reasons he's running for the office of senator. And uh, he run, won the primary, as you know. I hope and pray he will win the general election as well. Okay. Um, so righteousness. And, and that we have to submit to true biblical righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So you see, Christian friends, is that this means that there's no more law, Christ is the end of the law, and we don't have to abide by the law anymore. Thank God, free at last, free at last, we have been set free, and we can live any way we want to. We become sexual perverts. And we can do it just as long as we say Jesus and we go to some Judeo Christian church like the, you know, the Lutherans or whatever, you know, we can be good Catholics and wear our beads and rub them. And we can, you know, and pedophilia, it isn't growing in the Catholic church by accident. Guess what? We little faggots have been provided for that. We are steeped in the, we are embedded in the Catholic church because. They've done away with the law to a large ex extent. Okay, I'm being... Am I being funny or am I being real? I mean, I really think to a large degree, to, that's really what's happened in a lot of these churches. Presbyterian churches, they're ordaining homosexual ministers and doing all kinds of stuff to pervert that Judeo-Christian denomination. And it's happening in the Baptists and others. Some of them are a little slower in some of these areas, but, you know, hey, progressivism, give them, give them a while. Time means nothing to these people. And uh, as long as they have control of the government, uh, they can accomplish a lot of things. That's why, one reason why they're awfully worried about Donald Trump. And boy, I've got to say to a large extent, I have always been a supporter of Donald Trump, but I really am amazed that that man has stuck to his word and done a lot of good things. No, he's not perfect. I understand that. We all understand that. But boy, he is a thorn in the flesh to the communistic progressives. And that's what they are. They're co they hate America. This whole like we were talking about earlier in uh, past previous messages, this whole um, football thing is a communist movement. It's a socialist communist movement, and it's about hating America. And hating America, and they make no... Uh, it, they're very open in, in, in this, is about hating white people. And 
oh no, well, we really don't want to say that because, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we don't, it's too sensitive of a subject matter. You know what it is? It's the truth. And, and people aren't willing, in many cases, to speak the truth about what the, the agenda these people have behind them. And to a large degree, I've got to say, they're not smart enough on their own to do this. They've been, this whole uh, agenda, this whole scenario, this communist scenario is being bought and paid for like George Soros, Soros type people. Now, Antichrist people, I am so happy that a very small percentage of Hollywood is being exposed in this Weinstein Jewish pervert situation here. And that, that could also grow. The exposure of Hollywood. Now, I know, it's, I know it's somewhat growing. You know, and people will point to, well, hey, Tom Hanks, he, he, he spoke out and said he's, you know, like Jane Fonda, he's known about it for a long time. And, and uh, he said even stronger things. Tom Hanks is a part of this. Just like uh, uh, Ben Affleck and um, others, they've been a part of this corruption. Look at the movies. Look at the language. Look at the perversion that comes from Hollywood. Look at them lecturing us all the time and pointing their finger. It's like they're so righteous. The Hollywood values need to guide and lead us. And, and then they're dictating to us on gun rights, and they make movies about uh, killing people all the time in some of the grossest, horrible, most horrible ways you can think of. And they're all the time putting out extremely perverted movies. They won't let it go. They have to flash it before us all the time, constantly, constantly. You can't see a good movie today without gross sexual perversion in it. And look at the effects that ha that has upon society. And of course, it's always been the meaning has always been well. There, who can say what's right or wrong? It's all anti-Bible movies for the most part that Hollywood makes. Now, yes, there are Christian organizations that are making some Christian films. I wish they could improve on that even a little more. You know, they're Judeo-Christian based and some of the topic matters aren't the best, but you know, they're making some slight improvements there. But really, Hollywood itself, the Hollywood, the Hollywood industry, they constantly put forth perverted movies. Perverted in their uh, subject matter, in the values, and they are teaching values. Situational ethics, all of this, this social, the social gospel of Hollywood, they've been involved in it. Billions and billions of dollars are used to pervert the minds of the American people, and they've been doing that way before even Leave It to Beaver, my friends. Way before even that. Okay. Let me use an example of a movie. May I do that? Well, I'm going to anyway. How many of you remember that movie uh, back in the 80s? Uh, it might have been 1980 uh, that it came out called 925. Working 925 for a living, you know. You know, oh, what a catchy little tune. Jews wrote that, produced that. It is, and it's, I have to say, on a lot of movies, especially when they're getting their social agenda over across to the people. And people, it, it just goes right over their head. They, they'll throw a few funny lines in there and the people, oh, how, oh, that's fair. Oh, look at Dolly Parton. She's so funny there. Look at Lily Tomlin. Oh, wow, you know, and they get caught up in this BS. Excuse my French. Didn't that come from France? Isn't it? Well, anyway, um, it is a feminism Highly feminine, 
uh, feminization film. And they made the uh, boss man, I don't even know his, who, uh, who he was, uh, look uh, stupid, but the women and their agenda throughout the movie uh, was putting forth uh, family values or values that are directly against the Word of God. Um, it, it really would blow your mind for a lot of these movies from back when, yesteryears, for people to go back and watch. Because, you know, like we have pointed out, look at uh, I Love Lucy. How many of us, you know, 50, 60 on up years, of o years old, watched I Love Lucy and thought, oh, ha, 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 it, she's so funny, what a comedian. You know, people people will get mad at me, but I want to point out Lucille Ball was Jewish. Lucille Ball at that movie was putting forth the idea of multiculturalism. She was married to Lesi uh, Desi Arnaz, a Mexican. Okay, yeah, but you know, it it was so simple. He, what did you say? He was a communist. Yeah, and he was a communist. Uh, so many of these guys were the uh, the uh, McCarthyism. Really, he wasn't even touching the iceberg hardly for the extent of it as far as deeply involved and embedded this commun the communists that were embedded in our nation. And really, let's, let's tell the truth on it, to a large extent, it was Jewish produced. And the Jews are still involved in it. And, you know, no one, of course, most people, and you will not ever hear us from a Judeo-Christian. They don't want to think about the Jewish idea because there's, they're steeply and in, deeply involved in esteeming the Jew. They will even tell you that the Jews can basically do no wrong. They can live like the children of hell that they are, or a lot of them, and they can, they can be in the kingdom. God's going to save them anyway because they're Jewish. They're God's chosen people they will say. Maybe not all of them, but a lot of them do. Trust me. Okay. But my point is, getting back to this, is there's this gospel of unrighteousness that is before, before our very eyes that's put forth. This agenda is put forth preaching unrighteousness to us. And therefore, people pattern themselves to a large extent after this highly tainted, perverted gospel of Hollywood. And now, again, Weinstein's being exposed. Let me use that term again. He's just the tip of the iceberg, folks. I mean, I, I really, I, I, you would be hard-pressed to point out one, per, one of these Hollywood entertainers, these Hollywood perverted whores, and, and male and female, they're just whores that are part of that industry that are not out there perverting the hearts and minds of the people. Well, I saw, I saw Tom Hanks, and he started in this good war movie, and it was a good war message. Really, the war message is a good message? Uh, how many of these people, by the way, have seen these horrors like him in Hollywood, and they'll do, quote, a good movie. Well, it seemed to have good American values in it. The flag was there, you know, and all that. And then they'll turn right around and do a perverted movie. Doesn't seem to matter. I did like, uh, the other day, somebody sent me a John Wayne little clip. I sent it to a lot of people. And he was singing in their God Bless America. And then it took off with a lot of the uh, actors back in the 70s of singing that as well. Now, I know the actors weren't perfect. I know John Wayne was 
uh, not perfect. He was married to Mexican wives, and he uh, did some things that were not perfect or good. But I tell you what, his life was a whole lot cleaner than most of these entertainers today. But he did, I thought, and, and especially in light of the flag issue and all that, and I'm not saying the you know, because of what America is today, I understand, and we're not to worship the flag. I'm, I'll, I'll, you know, I have to explain all this to people because they'll say that, well, well, John Wayne, he was this, and John Wayne was that. You know, uh, well, did you know that John Wayne received the Spotlight magazine? Which doesn't mean he was perfect, but he understood a lot of things. He was a, he was a member of the John Birch Society. He had some good values behind a lot of what he believed. And who knows, folks, uh, he, like a lot of us, may have watched and seen and what was put forth in the Judeo-Christian world a long time ago and said, I don't want any part of that. And, you know, I can't really blame him. You know, you look at, first of all, the doctrine like uh, uh, hell and the rapture and, and other things that are put forth in the uh, Judeo-Christian gospel. And is that true? Of course not. And, the, and, the, and they realize that uh, a lot of the values that Judeo-Christianity are putting out, especially today, are the reason that America is going downhill. Okay. But there's a lot that's wrong with religion and the nation today that has to be corrected. And you have to understand that. I'm not saying that, hey, in a few sermons or, or articles or anything like that, it can be straightened out. Maybe a lot of you are saying, well, you're stating the obvious, Pastor. The, maybe the obvious needs to be stated and more directly again. Because we cannot play around with what the problem is and just give it lip service and do nothing about it and stand nothing on righteousness. Lifting up the banner of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there are a lot of good ways that we can do that. But we have got to get back to being serious about what true, biblical, righteous, the standard is. We've got to walk forth with the righteousness of Christ in a much bolder way than what we are and what we have been. And people are starting to get involved. Like I said last week, and I've been saying for a number of weeks now, it's the remnant who, to a large degree, are starting to wake up now. They've been waiting for the truth to come forth and someone to preach the truth and, and other things like that. They've been waiting, to a large degree, for a president like we have today. Not that he's the standard of righteousness. We all know he's not perfect. But God put forth, I believe, President Donald Trump to awake, help, help awaken the remnant. And that's what's happening today. Now, uh, verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness, which is of the law. Okay? Notice it says, don't miss that, it is of the law. Righteousness is of the law. But it's not our salvation. Okay? That the man which doeth those Things shall live by them, meaning the law. And this is at the time of Moses. And at that time, technically, that was our Israel's means of salvation. We all know this and understand this. And the message is, we are not, quote, saved by works of the law. But that does not do away with... Uh, the righteousness. You see, we've got to get into understanding what Christ in you, the hope of glory, is all about. We've got to get into understanding what the new covenant process is 
See, when you go to Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 10, it talks about the new covenant. And God's going to write his laws within the hearts and minds of Israel. He's not putting it away. He's, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And through Christ in us, and that understanding, that word understanding, growing in our lives, especially as we read God's word and apply God's word and pray about God's word, righteousness grows in us. It's not some instantaneous thing. How many people do you know that when they got saved, oh, I have all righteousness understanding? And they act like that's what it's all about. That is not where it comes from. That's not what it's all about at all. Okay, so what these verses mean is, and to a certain degree too, is yes, we are saved by faith, by faith in Christ, not faith in the law. We're, none of us are saved by, oh, I've got faith in the law. I want to, oh, I want to be a believer and in the law and worship the law. That's not what it's about. It, because if you want to grow in knowledge of the law, you want Christ in you. You come to Christ in faith. You make that the first part of your step of faith, quote faith. Verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thine heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach." And that is, what is that word again? Christ is that word. And that's what Paul was saying, what we preach. You see, it's a whole package. People look at it as one little chunk. Well, look at it another way. It's the whole rock. It's the whole package, all of it. And when you're getting Christ in you, you are absorbing that whole wonderful spiritual Holy Spirit Word of God package. I like to tell people this too, is where would we be today if we did not have the written Word? Think of where we would be. I mean, that is a real blessing, folks, that we can pick up God's Word. I don't have to go to man to ask, well, what, what's your philosophy on life so I may follow and get off track? And that's, in simple explanation, really how it works in the deception process. We've got to be in the Word. And so when we are talking about having faith in Christ... It is much more of a, quote, thing than what we have been taught or what a lot of people understand it to be. And it's not a burden. It's not a burden. It's like people come along and say, well, you know, following the law is such a burden. Really? Oh, like, again, I point out, man's laws aren't. The IRS manual isn't. The volumes of laws of man are not. I mean, how many of you have heard lawyer after lawyer speak today? They even say, my God, the IRS manual, I don't even understand it myself. I have to go hire an expert, even myself, to get them to explain it to me or get me in compliance. I would definitely like to see the end of the IRS. But, wow. Wow. It just amazes me on what the uh, things that Donald Trump is, is putting forth on it. Yeah, I understand he needs to go a whole lot further. Uh, the IRS needs to be abolished. The Federal Reserve needs to be abolished. A lot of things need to be abolished. In fact, 
I would say over 90% of the bureaucracy of our federal government, folks, needs to be abolished. Let, let's understand that. So don't think Pastor Barley's naive about it. But you know, they aren't happy about him trying to chip away. And believe me, he's trying. Well, and not just in that area, look at the medical area too. I'm not saying again what he is putting forth or espousing on the uh, medical plan is anything really it's going to be great and bring us into righteousness. But think of the swamp again and all the trouble he's having from the swamp. It's just, just a, another indication of how corrupt our nation is and the people that are, that are in Congress, both houses today. Look at the people in the courts, especially the Ninth Court. I, you know, I shouldn't say especially. You know, folks, when you get to the Supreme Court, it's just as corrupt as the Ninth Court in many ways. So, you know, uh, they're, they're just, you know, you can go on and on with this. But, you know, can't you see, still, just as I can see, there's changes. And God's using Donald Trump in his imperfections, his many imperfections, with all of his Jews in office, yes, because he has Jews in office. Yeah, I'm aware. With all his Jews in office, he is a wrecking ball against the, a lot of the establishment. And the media. Oh, he's a wrecking ball against it. I've never seen anybody. No, folks, we, we, uh, I myself, I don't think I could do half of what... Trump has done in the standing up against the media. I mean, what a God's called the man of the hour that he wants on that throne or the presidency, I mean. And he's really chipping away. He's knocking down a lot of things. And he's also this Weinstein Jew pervert. And, oh, oh. You know, I can smell, you know, people talk about Pizzagate a while back. I don't know. Uh, uh, there's nothing there, nothing to see there. Keep moving, keep moving. I think there's plenty to see on that pizza gate. I think there's plenty to see on a, 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 a trafficking of women and children and murder of children. I mean, uh, um, I remember years ago reading about uh, the... Um, um, I, I forgot the uh, place in California where all these leaders go and they do their uh, occultic stuff and how many of them are involved in it. You know, Henry Kissinger, uh, movie stars, you I mean, politicians. What would you say? Oh, I think I said it wrong. Never mind. The Grove. The Grove. Yes, The Grove. That's it. And that's still there. Yeah. Highly protected, highly secret place. And the stuff they do there is so per perverted, so occultic. I also remember now, Hefner just died. Hugh Hefner died. Yeah, Hugh Hefner died too, and he was a major part of that. All oh, that that this uh, uh, pornography, this por this uh, perversion that it took place. Play Playboy magazine. I mean, all the but I mean. How many times when you grew up, uh, uh, you older folks, you, and, and, uh, all the time we'd hear, uh, oh, but they had great articles. They had great articles. They're so enlightening. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, you might as well say, well, there's this, uh, there's this great homosexual lesbian magazine, oh, but it had great articles. There's a pedophilia magazine. Oh, but it had great articles. <laughs> Give me a break. Okay, now. Um, but what saith it? Okay, I've, I've already got it. Verse 9. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him, meaning Christ, from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. Well, that's it, Pastor. 
No more to see here that, that, you know, just all we have to do is, according to this verse here, is, is, is believe. Is that the only thing you've got out of these verses that we've been reading here? And, and therefore, what the Judeo-Christians do and the altar calls is come down to the aisle, and Billy Graham, you come down the aisle and get saved, fill out the, church, the paperwork here, and you're in heaven, buddy. Is that what this means? Yeah, not unless you pay tithes, yeah. <laughs> Righteousness. It says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Unto. We believe. First of all, in who? In Christ. But when we're believing in Christ, we're believing unto righteousness. Folks, that is, that is just not a one-time little step, and that's it. Don't do anything else. It's unto. Boy, this, the, you, mean, you talk about the road of eternity. That's it right here. Unto, it, it leads us into all understanding of righteousness. It will follow the word, Christ. Because he will, as we follow him in proper faith and write his purposes, his will, his law, his plan, his purposes within our heart. And we will have a real, quote, new covenant understanding. Now, it says, and with the mouth confess, confession is made unto salvation. Oh, hallelujah, Pastor. There we have it. Salvation. Salvation. Who was the subject matter unto? What did we read about in verse 1? Have you forgotten that, dear friends? Some of you have. Pray to God for Israel, is that they might be saved. Is there a world appeal is here in any of these verses? Folks, I'm not trying to mislead you. I'm trying to lead you in what the Word of God contextually states the truth. And the truth will set you free. Now, I'm not saying this is the only truth. But we Judeo-Christianity has got this wrong. They really do. And we have to understand that. And we've got to get on the right biblical path and right biblical understanding on this. Verse 11. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall be saved. See, Pastor? Anyone who believes in him. I want to remind, re, uh, uh, draw your attention back to verse 1. Did I say that? God for Israel that they might be saved. That's the context of these verses. Oh, but pastor, read the next verse. We got you there. Oh, really? Verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Do you know that, folks? There's no difference. What does that mean? You know, it's easy to make statements like that and take verses out of context and ask, and, you know, throw it in somebody's face. Is anybody confused? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> on what this verse might mean or might say or what it implies. It's not just implying anything. It's actually stating quite clearly. And we got to get, we got to go and and get understanding on this verse, especially if you're confused about it, because really it's gospel, it's a new covenant. Unto Israel and the northern house. Well, who are the northern house? God's word says over and over that they are the Gentilized, dispersed. They were lost. They were divorced. They didn't have any hope. They needed a redeemer. Christ is their redeemer. And that is whom uh, the Apostle Paul and others, were, that was their ministry. Christ sent the, him and others unto the Gentiles. And by the way, 
uh, in 70 AD and even before that there's happening that the disciples or others that they had uh, led to the, through the, new, the true gospel went unto the Gentilized. And that into Europe and Spain and uh, Asia Minor, they went to these Gentilized Israelites, these intro, in, in Israelites who had become paganized or Gentilized or heathenized. So, but it says, for there is no difference between the Jew, meaning the Judean, those of the southern kingdom of Judah, which included Judah, part of Benjamin, part of the Levites, and there were other scattered Israelites in among them as well. And they were known or called uh, Judeans. They were even to a degree called Jews because they lived in Jerusalem or in that area uh, at that time. And Christ came unto the Judeans first, not the dispersed northern house of Israel. He came unto the Judeans first. Then he went unto the Greeks. The Greeks? What? They, yeah, they're part of the dispersed, but it really means the Gentilized northern house of Israel. That's what this term literally means on the Greek. This is not a world gospel that is being presented. Going on, it says, For the same Lord Christ over all is rich unto all that call upon him. In the context of this verse, my dear friends, look at whom he is addressing. He is addressing all of Israel. And God's calling, God, Jesus Christ is the redeemer of Israel. He came to redeem that which had fallen and lost. He didn't come to re redeem China. He didn't come to redeem Korea. He didn't come to redeem dark Africa. I'm just stating the truth of what God's word and the context. I didn't write these verses. I didn't make these statements. Look at Romans Again, 9 and verse 4. It's unto Israel. It says unto Israel, it's the gospel message. It's the giving of the law. It's the services of God. All these things are unto Israel, about Israel, and for Israel. And when we get that true gospel message in proper context, we're going to start seeing a righteous change in our nation. We're going to see things change for the better because we will be in the proper biblical order and doing the proper biblical, applying that proper biblical order in the nation and the nations of Israel. And they have to become the light. We are not going to become the light by trying to become as multicultural as we possibly can and giving up our rights and our freedoms and our, and our biblical purpose. We're literally giving up our biblical purpose every time we, we extend ourselves into abiding in this false gospel of multiculturalism. You know, a lot of people are going to be shocked by the things that I've said here today and going over these verses because to a large, large degree, that's been their pet verse. And that's what they hang their hat upon is this chapter. And about salvation. Oh, it's, a, it's such a wonderful gospel of salvation. Yeah, it is. Absolutely it is. But when you pervert that gospel and the message, what are you doing? Where, is, is it truth you're actually you're absolutely you're presenting, or is it a falsity? And what will that perverted gospel, even though it may be well intended, what is it going to produce? You know, folks, you can you can have well intentions on uh, legitimizing Sodom, a sodomite lifestyle, or or a lot of different things. You, you can legitimize abortion. Or emphasize. 
Is God going to bless that? I want God to bless all of us, our families, our na- but I want Him to bless America. I'm going to keep stating this to the day I die. Righteousness exalts the nation. Righteousness. True biblical righteousness in all aspects of that word of righteousness. We need it. We need to abide it. We need to uphold it. We need to praise God for it. We need to walk in that righteousness. Do the best of our abilities in prayer and reading God's word and making sacrifices. Yes, don't we all need to give up things and walk and, and walk, try to walk as righteously and live as righteously unto our Savior in honor of Him. And then His blessings will flow as we do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that what I've said in this message and in these messages will turn people's hearts unto righteousness. Especially in light of what you, your word says, turn the hearts of the children unto the fathers. And meaning, I mean in that to chur- turn the hearts of the children of Israel unto you, our heavenly Father. May you be play- praised.